that is going now. Um, I'm actually just going to intervene here. And Katoa. Um, my name is Hugh Campbell, and I'm in, in the happy position, hello to people online, of introducing Emeritus Professor Frank Griffin, uh, who is a man of some significant stature on campus here, um, for many reasons, Frank. I think my um, long-term acquaintanceship with Frank has uh, been uh, regarding the Ag at Otago research theme, which uh, Frank has been the key instigator and great driver of, which is now uh, bearing quite some fruit across campus with our new Professor of Ag Innovation, Craig Bunt, and a burgeoning agricultural innovation program. So Frank, really, and, and none of that was in your original area of uh, research in microbiology, so well, semi-related. Yeah, so uh, you, you, you've you, not only have you left a great footprint on the campus, but it's expanding. And you're participating in that. And uh, so I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, you have some very, very uh, considered thoughts on how we are understanding greenhouse gas emissions in farming uh, and how different options for land use in New Zealand's future uh, are really pivoting around a series of questions that we haven't yet answered about how to understand greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. Uh, although maybe by the end of today, all those questions will be answered by Frank Griffin. <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed to you for, for that uh, very uh, pleasant and amiable introduction. What I'm going to do today is talk about uh, climate change, more specifically as it relates to agriculture. And there's only a few places on campus where you see agriculture mentioned. And one of them is outside your building because I notice agriculture is on your, your uh, sign out there. So that's very good. Uh, and what, uh, what I want to do is to, to uh, essentially show you how a sort of a, a change in my life's interests in the last 10 years was spawned by some academic activities in an environment paper. And a few years ago, I started teaching a little component in the environment 312 paper. And it sort of, it, it gave me a whole new perspective on life and things in general. I spent my whole life as an immunologist looking at disease of animals. I've always been closely connected to, to agriculture, but really this was delving into areas of agriculture that I didn't really understand very much about at all. But hopefully in the context that science knowledge is transferable between disciplines, one would hope that somebody who had an interest in immunology could possibly capture some ideas about climate, about the environment. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. I'll specifically talk about agriculture first, because it's not a common theme on campus. But you will see here that we do have, in fact, uh, uh, two components of agriculture activities. The first one is Ag Aratago, which is the research activity around agriculture. And we captured that name from Janet, who gave it to us very kindly as a name she had used somewhere along. And it sounded to me cryptic and sort of neat. So that's what we call it, Agrotago, with your permission. Uh, secondly, we have the degree structure, which is agriculture innovation, which is taught as part of the uh, applied science program. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is talk about uh, sort of the, the context in which I'm operating in agriculture. And secondly, uh, we'll talk about uh, climate and climate change. Now, if we look at New Zealand, it's obviously a very young country in terms of development and habitation, uh, and it's even young geologically. But if we look at the country, you'll see there's obviously a number of uh, different facets we can look at. We can first of all look at New Zealand as a farm, because Hugh has told me in earlier days that in fact, New Zealand was colonized largely to produce food for Britain. So there is a reason for us to have an agricultural basis. But I still see New Zealand as essentially two big farms, one called the South Island and one called the North Island, or the mainland and the other one. So, and you will see there that basically we have, hab we have inhabited this land and almost any flat area we've colonized and done something to it. And you can see obviously on the left-hand side there, we have pasture farming on the lower uh, uh, landscape. 
We have obviously dairying coming through as a very important industry. And you can see it's in fact, uh, this is a slightly old slide. In fact, now we're seeing much more dairying activity in Canterbury and in Southland than we did before, but we're certainly seeing dairying emerge as a major primary initiative. And uh, uh, that, that sort of feeds the, the central part of the economy. We also have a past, we also have an arable farming area where around Christchurch we have some of the best arable land in the country. And that is very important because if you in fact eat a carrot almost anywhere in the world, it almost certainly came from a seed which, was, which started its life in New Zealand because we produce 70% of the world's carrot seeds. So we have all these sort of interesting niches that New Zealand agriculture has found, and we're very big on certain seed production, and we do that really well, but generally we have limited arable farming. And then we come to the other, which is the recreational side, and here we have one of the most unique resources in the world, which is the New Zealand National Parks which are some of the most outstanding scenery, accessible very closely on the planet. So we have this, we, we've succeeded in, in wedging away around most of New Zealand, except this area here is probably still relatively under uh, ex explored, but apart from that, we've essentially seen a lot of development in, in a lot of different areas of agriculture. Uh, we also have done important things to get land. We've cut down forests, and we've drained the bogs. So you can see what's happened in the country over a hundred years. We here have these wetlands, and they've been largely drained and turned into fertile farmlands. And if you look at the Haraki Plains and areas like that, you'll see essentially, they're, they're all, it was a big marsh, which essentially was drained and turned into fertile, highly fertile farming land because of the very high carbon content. So we've, we've drained the bogs. We've cut down the trees, we've made the pastures, we've plowed the land, and we've done a lot of the country in the last hundred years. And what I want to do now is see how, if in any way that has impacted on uh, climate and agriculture, or the nexus between the two. And if we look at agriculture, we can break it into two phases. We can look at what happened pre, pre say, the, the 1950s, uh, and post 1950s, because agriculture has had a completely different effect historically and currently. Historically, agriculture had no negative impacts at all on climate. It was very low tech, and it was basically uh, low energy, and essentially there was, there was not a lot of impact. Since 1960, everything has changed, because there we've had the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution, was essentially the birth child of Borlaug, who's an agriculturalist and a geneticist. And he, back in post Second World War, decided that we had to do agriculture better. We had to produce more food and we had to produce it more efficiently. So he basically selected types of plants which were resistant to disease, which were more stunted than the normal tall wheat plants, and were also produced larger heads of corn. So they were more productive, they were disease resistant and resistant to climatic change. And using those, he changed the face of agriculture. And from that was spawned a new phenomenon, which is the monoculture of plants. And you can see up top there, we have the monoculture, uh, just a single type of plant grown in very large acreages to produce a crop very efficiently. And then on the back of that, we had a whole lot of other things introduced to change the face of farming. We introduced irrigation for agriculture before it was introduced for cities, but here we now put it into the dry lands. So we have irrigation, we have mechanization and more and more machinery producing more and more activities. We have also the use of chemicals. So we have inorganic sprays, insecticides, pesticides, chemicals of every type and fertilizers. And then we have intensification at a, an industrial level and we have Last of all, something that's gone on throughout our history, which is deforestation. We wanted more land. So we cut down the forest to create more land. And we've, the last place we're seeing that manifest is obviously in the Amazon Basin, where we're seeing removal of the trees and change of the whole ecology of those areas. So this is what we did to farming in the last 60 years. We mechanized it, we industrialized it, we increased the chemical footprint, and we produced a lot of food.
So we had a way of uh, making farming work. And the success of New Zealand in that arena is here seen Mr. Watson from Canterbury, who has successively produced world record amounts of corn on the crops he produces. And you can see back in 19, uh, 2017, he produced a world record of 16 tons, nearly 17 tons per hectare. And then he went on later to produce 18 tons per hectare. And that's phenomenal. When you're thinking of normal crops it would have been three or four tons per hectare. So this is a phenomenal increase in capacity. So he's producing these incredible crops. He has captured uh, all of uh, the modern concepts of farming and put them all together. He's used his chemicals, he's used his tillage, he's used the best uh, species to use, and so he's went. If we look at what the whole retrospect of the Industrial Green Revolution, we see there's a lot of important things have happened. We've reduced biodiversity, we've reduced carbon lay down in soils, we've lost the wetlands, we've reduced soil fertility in some areas, and we've replaced that with chemical additives, and we've lost topsoil because of extensive tillage of ground, uh, which is on slopes. Then if we look at the other side, we've increased deforestation, we've increased the use of chemicals, we've done a whole bunch of things. And the reality is today we cannot continue using that model for food production in New Zealand. Not in the context of climate change and in the context of the new constraints we're going to have in food production. It's no longer acceptable to use as much fertilizer as you wanted to to satisfy your own requirements. We now have to work within a set of rules which are much more constrained. And if we look at New Zealand where we're starting, you see we're starting from a position of advantage. New Zealand is a very fertile country. It has a very temperate climate. It has lots of rain. So in fact, we have a lot of things going for us to be a farm. And you can see here, if we look at one of the indicators of the fertility of the ecosystem, it's soil carbon. And if we look at soil carbon, you can see we have about an average of 90 tons per hectare throughout New Zealand, which is very high. You may find little niche areas which have over 100, but in fact, generally, you don't have more than 60 or 70. So we're, we're doing very well. We have, we have good supply of carbon compared to almost any other country, except this figure here from the UK, which is where they use peatlands. Peatlands are always far richer in carbon than normal soil. So we are, we, we've got very good supplies of carbon. But when we farm, we can change that carbon. And here's an example of some of the things that happen when you start to get into intensive farm. We started out here with land which looks like something up top. There's a bit of sort of scrubby New Zealand backcountry. Uh, not that productive, but obviously it hasn't had a lot of agricultural inputs into it, really. It's relatively untouched raw land. But if we look at what, ha what happens underneath the sod in that area, if we treat it different ways, you see what can happen. Here we have some uh, soil on the left-hand side, which is under permanent pasture, good pasture. And you can see it has a nice big layer of topsoil, which is very rich in carbon, and that's really quite healthy, good soil. If we look at what happens to that soil, if we start to till it, this is what happens. If we take this soil here and plow it, we mix this all together. And now we have the soil which looks more like this, right? It's going to mix it, so we bury some of the topsoil underneath, and we get the carbon distributed to a deeper level. But in time, if we keep on tilling that soil, it loses that carbon. So you can see here that obviously there are disadvantages in uh, wholesale tillage without some other intervention. And if we look at what's going on underneath the soil, which is the, the microbiome or the living organisms in the soil, we'll see there's some interesting things happening. Here's the microbiome of pasture, which has been intensively fertilized with synthetic fertilizer. And you can see it's got roots, but very little else. If we look at soil here, which has been treated naturally with biologic stimulants rather than synthetic fertilizers, it's completely different. And you can see it's, it's got this sort of slimy layer all over it. It's got a really active rhizosphere or fungal mattress in there, and it's producing soluble carbon. 
So it's capturing carbon from the atmosphere. It's transferring it to its root system into the soil. And this is how we build soil. We give the plant the sort of nutrients it needs to be productive, and then it will create this wonderful ecosystem, which is great. Here's what happens in soil, which is treated different ways. This one on the right-hand side here is just conventional farmland. This one here is farmland, which has been treated regeneratively or holistically. And you can see what happens in that soil over time. The carbon spreads all through the soil. And down here, you will have four times more carbon than in the soil here, which is essentially been uh, untreated. So we go. So you can see that we can change the nature of soil by the way we manage it. And that brings carbon onto the stage. Now, carbon is a topic we just talk about widely. It's the commonest and most important element on the planet. And it does all sorts of things. Healthy carbon and the right amounts in your soil gives you all kinds of options. First of all, it produces more food. It sequesters carbon from the atmosphere, so you can store carbon in, the, in, in healthy soil. You can, you can purify water, you can drain it, you can affect the climate, you can affect nutrients in the soil, you can uh, have all sorts of different organisms in it, you can regulate floods, you can do all sorts of things by having healthy soil, which essentially is granular and porous and can store lots of water. And we, we can see what happens in reverse. If we overexploit the soil, then we have flooding because we can't absorb the water. So we don't retain the water. We have more erosion. We have more of all sorts of things. So carbon is really important, but it's not just important for storing or sequestering carbon. It's important for a whole bunch of things it does. So essentially, it influences everything about the health and well being of the soil. And then we move below the soil and consider what the plants do. And then we, we talked about we grow monocultures. Well, if you grow monocultures, you have a very limited outcome because monocultures will only produce a limited kind of growth phase. If you want to have efficient growth of plants, you need a mixture of plants rather than a single plant. So you need polycultures rather than monocultures to maximize the productivity of soil. And that, here's an example of uh, looking at different kinds of plants. And you can see very simply, each plant has a different root system. It explores a different part of the soil and contributes differently to it. So these ones here give you a whole range. These ones are very lucerne, it's very deep, so it goes down very deep, it can get water and minerals from the soil. And each of these make a different contribution to make a whole ecologic system, which is very efficient. So polycultures are much more efficient than monocultures. And that brings us to the transition from green uh, revolution to a new old way of farming. And this is a new system which has in fact been brought out, so it's back to the future now. And we're here now looking at a new system which has just been endorsed by the government's funding last week when it gave a tattoo 8 million to look at regenerative farming or holistic farming. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that this is the answer to everything, but I'm suggesting it's something which needs to be explored properly to work out what are the scientific drivers in there and how can we move forward or what should we move forward with. So if we talk about regenerative farming, what does it engage? It goes on from the green revolution and basically it's completely different. First of all, it says, put away your plant. Don't disturb the soil. Leave those normal organisms which are all living happily together and doing wonderful things, interacting with the plants. Leave them alone and they'll do very well. So the first thing is you minimize the amount of disturbance of your soil. You directly drill your seeds in rather than planting the soil. And that leaves the soil intact as a whole ecosystem. The next thing is you have as much diversity as possible. So you show a whole lot of different plants. Uh, the next thing is you need to keep the soil covered. Because if you look at a piece of soil which is bare and a piece of soil which is vegetation, the vegetative soil will have about a maximum of 25 degrees that it will ever reach temperature wise, and the bare soil will reach 60 to 70 degrees. So you're cooking bare soil every time the sun shines on that, it essentially kills every living thing that's in or associated with it. So having cover is important. We also need the roots in the ground all the time because they're constantly mining and distributing things in the atmosphere. And lastly, livestock are not a bad word. Livestock are essential to maintain an ecologic balance with plants and pasture. 
Without them, the, the whole thing would come to a halt. So having something to eat the plants is really quite important because that contributes importantly to what goes on in the soil. And then you see what, what constitutes the dogma of regenerative farming. And here we can see how we apply that in a farm setting. So we produce a mixture of plants, uh, we grow them all, we, the animals then graze or eat on those if there is pasture. And you can see here the first thing is we use the large numbers of animals. We no longer have a small number of animals eating a big paddock. We have a large number of animals eating a small area of land. And this is really important because the way we graze the pasture is hugely important in defining its ultimate function. And what we do is we put a large number of animals in, we leave them in there for a very short period of time. So if it was normally it would be half a day or a day, we'd leave them. Uh, sometimes they, they change them over two or three hours, but obviously that's very time consuming. Anyway, you, you, you have large numbers of animals and they go in and they graze the pastures. And you can see here, that's a nice pasture there. It's pretty well a monoculture of ryegrass. This is ryegrass and clover. Uh, and that's what most dairy cows live on in New Zealand. And obviously that is not a polyculture, that's two monocultures. So we have to consider, can we do better than that? We probably can. So the next thing is, here's an example of mass uh, grazing. These are sheep down in South Otago. And you can see they're almost shoulder to shoulder. And that's very good because on the shoulder to shoulder, they only take one bite on each plant and then they move on. If you give them, if you give them the whole paddock and only a few animals to select from it, they pick the ones they like best. So they become very selective in what they, they harvest. If you put them in and they're all shoulder to shoulder, they'll eat the first thing that passes their mouth. And that means they just take the top off the plant and that's what we want to achieve. We want to eat one third of the plant. We want to trample another third into the ground and we want to regrow the other third. And this way we can produce far more forage from a given area of land by not grazing it right down to the surface because if we do, we have a problem. And the problem is that if you graze down to the the surface of the soil, then you've got a problem because when you lose this photosynthetic leaf here, the roots die. So if you overgraze it, you essentially stunt the growth of your grass. So the idea is to do something we all would never have done before. You leave behind this amount of vegetation after the animals walk through, and they leave behind a fertile reservoir for producing the next growth phase. So then 40 days later, you'll come back with the same animals into the same pasture and this way. Now this is slightly different from rotational grazing used in New Zealand, which is the same principle, but it tends to be over much longer periods and much less dense grazing. So we look after the pasture and this is what happens. If we just take off the top, the roots remain perfectly intact and it reconstitutes itself very quickly and that's very efficient. Also another thing we've got to remember when we talk about plants is, a plant is not just a little bit of vegetative matter, it's a whole ecosystem. Because plants are just like you and I, they have more microorganisms on them than they have plant cells. So we, we have to remember when we select plants and use plants or are looking for, say if we're looking for plants that will grow in arid conditions, it probably will be because of the microorganisms which colonize the roots and leaves that gives them that characteristic. So a plant, is much more genetically than, it, than its own genes. And that's like us, we have our own microflora and so do most things. So this is really important, this plant grows and lives and can do all sorts of wonderful things. Now, if we look at greenhouse gases, it's taking a long time to get there, right? but we're there. And now we're saying that we, we are proposing there is a reason not to continue full-on green revolution, but to look at other possible strategies for managing this challenge we have in New Zealand farming. And the challenge we have in New Zealand farming is that if you look at global literature, the OECD will happily say, New Zealand tops the list in greenhouse gas emissions per capita. We do more than anybody else, because if we look at the ratio of cows to humans, it's higher in New Zealand than most places in the world. That doesn't mean we're producing the most greenhouse gas, but it means, uh, relatively speaking, we the, the animals do a, quite a job here, right? So here we're looking at the greenhouse gases, and you can see 
that we are top of the list. Uh, nearly 50% of our emissions are greenhouse gases, and that's because agriculture is a critically important part of the whole economy. And then if we look at this part as a component of GDP, you can see we're totally reliant on agriculture to essentially pay the hospital bills and to do most of the things we do in New Zealand. So it's a huge earner of export dollars, the food we produce. And you can see the countries which are closest to us are Ireland, which again has a very strong agricultural economy, France as well, and Denmark. Although it's part of GDP, the portion obviously is uh, uh, much smaller in these countries than it is with us. So this is very important because when we're talking about climate change, we have, to, we have to form alliances with people who share the same problems as we share. So if you look at what's going on over here, which is the debate about what impact has agriculture got on greenhouse gases, you can appreciate there's not much point of talking to the people from Japan, because they're not interested in the sort of problems we have, which are land-based. So if we're talking about changing policy, around climate change or around greenhouse gases, we must talk to like-minded people. And that's something which has preoccupied me always is, New Zealand's voice is really quite distinct from other voices, which is, really means that when it comes to things like nationally determined contribution, we must put that front and center on the table in wherever the next uh, COP is held. So, this is, this is where we're starting from. And people who tell you that greenhouse gas are not important in New Zealand and methane is not important, if you talk to most farmers, they say, but methane is not important. They say, it may not be important for you, but it's really important for people globally. And if you're going to dissociate your food from, an, from these negative associations, you better think about how you're going to do that. So if we look here, you can see what we've got here. The proportion of our greenhouse gases in, in New Zealand are, Carbon dioxide 44%, methane 44% are on the same, nitrous oxide 11%. So you can see where we have a huge contribution from three greenhouse gases, which have which function differently. So if we look here again at the greenhouse gas emissions, you can see that whatever kind of way you want to uh, equate this, here we can see we're top of this again for the contribution greenhouse gases make. Uh, to our country. But then look at the other side of it. When you talk about how efficiently we produce our food, New Zealand dairy will happily say, but look, there's no problem in New Zealand. We do it better than anybody else, because if you look at the footprint per kilogram of milk or per kilogram of meat, we have the lowest in the world. So we're, we're essentially emitting less greenhouse gases uh, per unit of food than other people are. And we've had the same argument again about transport and food miles and all the sort of thing historically. So this is the kickback you get. You know, get off my case. I don't care about methane because it's not that important. We're doing it still more efficiently than anybody else in the world. And that's obviously has to do then with public perception of where we're going to go. So greenhouse gases, what are they? Well, greenhouse gases essentially are gases in the atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I can go quicker, quicker. Uh, if we look at the gases, we basically have got three important chemicals, which are nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. And we have water vapor. A water vapor sits in the background because it is the molecule which produces all the downstream effects of climate change. So whenever we're talking about an effect, water will be involved either its presence or its absence. So, but it's not something we sort of factor into every discussion because it varies all over the place. So it's very hard to say what it means, but all it means is that when you have an increase in ocean temperature, you will have a 4% increase in, 4% uh, uh, increase in atmosphere or in, 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 in water vapor for a 1% increase in water temperature. So you're getting a disproportionate increase of what once it reaches about 12%, then it leaves the pole, it leaves the equator and comes to Nelson and gives us an atmospheric river or an atmospheric lake or whatever. So when we when we heat the oceans, they take up water vapor. When that water vapor reaches a certain level, it gets redistributed from the 
equatorial regions, the hot regions, the cooler regions. So that means if we look at Pearl Westport, it happens to be in the eye of the storm and has been year after year for the last few years. So this is important as the effector molecule. Uh, and it occurs in response to increasing ocean temperatures. Then we look at nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, and methane, and we find out what strategies do we have to manage these different greenhouse gases. Well, to understand what strategies we have to manage them, we have to understand what function each of them have in the biology of the planet. And we can see here, if we look at carbon or carbon dioxide as a gas, we can see it comes from essentially all metabolic activity of all living things. When things are alive, they respire or they use a metabolic cycle, which essentially gives out CO2 and takes up oxygen. So that's the whole principle of respiration. Uh, when they die, they break down and the, the, the products of breakdown essentially are various amino acids, various uh, biological molecules and CO2. When they respire, they release CO2. So during the day, plants take up CO2. During the night, they expire or transpire. So we have CO2 produced as part of the whole natural cycle of life. And every day, we produce lots of CO2. And each day, most of that CO2 is consumed. And most of it is consumed by the photosynthetic plants on the plant, because they take up CO2 during daylight, they turn it into biologic material, which is carbohydrate, and then you have essentially the carbon cycle renewed. The really important issue is, do we leave behind an excess of carbon dioxide on a given day? And we obviously do, because globally we are accumulating CO2 at increasing levels each year. And that is especially because of the long life of CO2. The, the, the life of a molecule of CO2 is suggested to be between hundreds of years and a thousand years. And you can take a pick in the middle. That means that we're, we're constantly having some of that residual material retained for years, and that means it builds up all the time. Whereas something like methane, which is a short-lived gas, it basically produces a little bit of gas, and then it, it equilibrates to that level, and it doesn't build the same way as CO2 builds, because it's a long-lived gas. Nitrous oxide is the same, it's a long-lived gas, but there's only a small amount of it. So, where do we get CO2 from? Well, we get CO2 when we burn things, when we respire, a whole lot of ways. And here's an example of the, the audit now for the Amazon. The Amazon algae historically has been the lungs of the plant. It consumed oxygen, it basically released, or it consumed carbon dioxide, it released oxygen, and it was all wonderful. And now you can see by deforesting the Amazon, we have succeeded in a very short period of time in turning the Amazon from being the lungs of the world into being inactive. Because now, in fact, all the forestry burning and uh, deforestation has massive amounts of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, both of which obviously have very adverse effects. So even the places which have, are historically reservoirs for uh, these things have now changed. Then we look at methane, and methane is really the, the molecule of our time in New Zealand. Because methane, again, is part of every biologic process. Whenever anything breaks down or dies, it basically gets, we get some methane. If we look at the, the soil, the organisms in the soil are of two types. We have methanogens, which make methane, and we have methanotrophs, which remove methane. I'll break it down. And the best place to look at that is the wetlands, because the wetlands contain both organisms in perfect harmony. And if you look at nature, you will see that everywhere there's a noxious agent, there's an antidote. That's, that's what evolution is all about. Evolution is about protecting systems and stabilizing them, not about destroying them. So all the stuff up on the planet have not been what nature did, it's what we did to nature. So it's very important for us to take some responsibility, I think, in some of these areas. So here we have methane, it's all over the place. It's produced, everything it decomposes. Here we, we have methanotrophs, which break down methane. We have methanogens, which make methane. And they happen, if you look in the wetlands, in the deeper anaerobic areas, you will have the methanogens, which are making methane. And then up at the surface, you have the methanotrophs, which are gobbling it up. So there's very little methane released from these when they're healthy. 
There's a balance between production and breakdown. So then we look at the, the whole the whole issues and what, we, what we're talking about, when we, which is not mentioned widely in climate change parlance, is what happens to a molecule and it, when it becomes part of the greenhouse gas cycle. Well, here we're looking at the example of the methane cycle. And you can see on the left-hand side, we have agencies which emit methane. And these are called the source. So for every molecule, you have a source, and then you, you potentially have at the other end a sink to store it or to break it down. So we've sourced in sinks. If we look at the conversation in New Zealand, it's almost exclusively about sources, not about sinks. Because we rarely ever talk about anything other than emissions. Everything about emissions. Agriculture is different in that it operates at both ends of the scale or biology in general does, that is, it produces these molecules, but also it can inactivate them or store them at the other side. So we're in a different situation in industry because we are both a source of all these molecules. And if we're talking about managing them, we don't understand them. Okay, so here we're looking at methane. All these ones on the left-hand side, essentially uh, fossil fuel use, per, uh, Energy, all these sort of things, agricultural waste, and all the biomass, biofuel, all these things produce methane. Also, the wetlands release some methane. And other things here, like inland waters, geologic things, all those also release. But everywhere these produce methane, they produce something which acts as a sink to remove the same. So the wetlands produce methane, but they also consume methane. So, the, well, everything on the right hand side, the green stuff is all good because that's consuming the greenhouse gas methane. This stuff on the left-hand side, we've got to manage it. So this is what we have to control, the amount of this stuff we produce. And if we do that correctly, then we get the balance back. And we, we reach a stage where methane, if we can control its uh, emission, we can then talk about essentially removing it as a greenhouse gas. So that's what we get. We get production and we get consumption. This here is the evidence that greenhouse gas is real. And greenhouse gas essentially as a chemical phenomenon was discovered about the 1870s, when they showed that certain molecules like carbon dioxide absorbed something, produced heat. So that meant if you took a CO2 gas and put it in a vessel, sat on the windowsill, it got warm. And it got warm because the molecules of CO2 could absorb heat. And the same for all the others. Same with methane, the same with everything else. And if you look then, there's a, there's a whole lot of chemistry around the efficiency with which it does that. And the frightening thing about methane is it's got a wavelength, uh, a light wavelength, an infrared uh, wavelength, which is really good for absorbing heat. So methane per unit molecule is at least 30 times as efficient as CO2. So it's a molecule which, in fact, if we could control the amount of methane, we probably could control temperature changes very effectively. And then you can see temperature has gone along coincidentally with this. And so we have increase in carbon dioxide, increase in global temperature. And then we have methane, and it's a little bit different. It's not a nice straight line. It came up like this. And then from about 200 to 210, it sort of leveled off. And we've had great arguments as to what happened then. We've equally got great arguments as to why the hell has it increased even quicker now. And there's a great argument about this. And people will suggest to you that we were getting greenhouse gas methane under control here, so it was stabilizing. And then something bad happened. And the suggestion in the big arena out there is this was agriculture that essentially was growing and expanding, and it was producing more methane. So you're having essentially this resurgence. So that means. Most of the increase in methane in recent times has been attributed to agriculture. And that's very important that we take ownership of that debate because it's affecting us. The, the thing I find quite kinky is that if you look at fertilizer use in New Zealand, it sort of mirrors that graph quite nicely. Not suggesting that New Zealand's fertilizer use is responsible for the world's methane, but there's, there's something funny went on there too. Okay. And then we have what really went on for the last 10 years is the absolutely uh, shameful destruction of most of North America with fracking. 
Because I, I can't think of anything good about fracking other than saying if we had no fossil fuel left on the planet, we need a little bit of that. Because fracking has been, to me, a constant disaster. It has recovered usable fuel in the form of methane, but the claims that this was going to be the salvation for fossil fuel use is absolute rubbish. Because we now know that, in fact, if you look at the increase in methane in recent times, you can most likely attribute it to leakage from oil wells and all kinds of places all over the planet. So there is a very good case, and in fact, uh, there's good evidence now that most of the recent increase in methane is probably to do with fracking rather than to do with agriculture. So that's an important point to establish. And here's what you see, what fracking looks or what uh, leakage of methane looks like globally. When you close your oil well, you don't seal it off. The gas keeps on coming out of it. So this is what's happening here. And if you look at these figures here, each of these are expelling 100 tons of methane per hour, completely uncontrolled. So if we look globally, there's an awful lot of methane being spilled all around the world. And this is what, what they do. They burn it off. And uh, also, if you frack, you have leaking all around where you have your fracking uh, wells. That's <coughs> what it's in, which is, what happens at the pole? This is what methane looks like at the pole. Really intense. And that's because, obviously, we have permafrost and we have uh, the icing of the pole. And when we do, we have a release of all the organic material that then becomes catabolized and we release methane. So you can have a sort of a bubbling mineral water at the pole especially the, the Arctic areas, because the ice has been eroded. So if we look at the, the greenhouse gas, where do they come from? I'll very quickly tell you where they come from. They come from three sources. Firstly, nitrogen starts out in the atmosphere as atmospheric nitrogen, or N2. It can be taken up by plants, and then it can be converted into a whole series of different nitrogenous molecules. It, it obviously, Human waste and all waste material or all organic material always contains nitrogen. And you can remine that out of the organic material if you want. What happens really, the importance of what happens here, because what happens here is you first of all break it down to produce ammonia. And then that ammonia is processed by microorganisms to become nitrite or nitrate, which will then associate with minerals to become calcium or sodium nitrite or nitrate. And that is now available as a nutrient or a fertilizer for the plant. So, the, so this would be broken down and produced here by uh, bacteria, then it could be taken up by plants, and that's good. If otherwise, it could be denitrified to become nitrous oxide. So the net effect here is two molecules, nitrate radicals and nitrous oxide. And both of those are equally important because not just not <laughs> because it is a greenhouse gas, and nitrate is important because it's a poison. So in Canterbury, people are concerned about nitrate uh, excretion because obviously it contaminates waterways and it's causing some significant issues. So here we have the nitrogen cycle. The two important molecules being nitrous oxide and nitrate. Then, I won't worry about that. If we now look at what New Zealand is doing in response to the climate change accord. Here is some of the issues that we can identify. Here, obviously, we have the, uh, uh, the interim panel for climate control, working through a series of options and recommendations as to what we're going to do about climate control in New Zealand in the future. And here we've got here some, some broad suggestions. First of all, if we reduce livestock numbers, that's obviously been fought very actively by farmers. The second thing is we can now include indigenous forests or riparian activities, if they're the right kind, as a potential source to sequester greenhouse gases. And obviously we can charge for people who are going to generate carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide as part of their farm system. If we look at how we're going to achieve a reduction in greenhouse gases, uh, we obviously need to treat carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide differently because they're long-lived from methane to short-lived and needs to be managed differently. And the suggestion is for methane, we could use synthetic nitrate inhibitors, urease inhibitors, 
We could use uh, vaccines. We could use modified diets for animals, or we could select animals that were uh, that produced less methane. So these are the options we've got in front of us for methane coming from the International Commission. My concern about what we've got at the table at present is, is it doesn't obviously complete the issue as to what we're going to do about greenhouse gases long term. I think what we haven't done yet is we haven't established what the life cycle and the cost of methane is. We essentially don't know what happens a molecule of methane from the time it's erupted from an animal's mouth to it disappears. Because there's, there are different dynamics in the life cycle of each of these molecules, and we need to understand what they are and we don't. Uh, so the other thing, and that is because we recently have discovered there is one very important molecule, which is as yet not within the confines of New Zealand climate change policy, and that is hydroxyl radicals. And recently we have discovered that if we look at the planet, there is a very special set of molecules called volatile organic molecules secreted by plants in low amounts. And these evoke a response to produce a totally new molecule, which comes from the breakdown of ozone when it comes to coming with sunlight. So every time sunlight strikes ozone, it will then combine with water to produce a radical. And this radical is called a hydroxyl radical. And it's a radical because it's an incomplete molecule. It's just OH. And it's looking for something to attach to. And this molecule has fortuitously become the antidote for all toxins in the atmosphere. So it will bind to carbon monoxide, it will bind to methane, it will bind to any, any nasty fluorocarbon that's in the atmosphere, it will essentially do a cleaning job. And it does that every day. So each day we have a new cycle of hydroxyl, and that's now available to neutralize whatever the target molecules are. So that means that when a molecule of methane leaves a cow, depending on the kind of pasture the animal's in, there could be a different amount of hydroxyl radicals produced by a different amount of stimulants, and we could in fact have most of the methane destroyed at source. So it may be that cows belching will emit a reasonable amount of methane, but most of it is completely inactivated. We don't know how much or if so. But that means that organic methane coming from animals could be treated totally differently environmentally than industrial methane, which doesn't come in contact with any of these magic molecules. So here the question is, what does hydroxyl do? And the, then we talk about using uh, vaccines against methane. I find that really challenging from my own personal point of view because I've spent my lifetime trying to get animals to respond to vaccines in the gut and I can't. So how we're suddenly going to make this thing work for uh, methanogens is an interesting challenge. So these things are technically very difficult. Uh, the other thing that I'm concerned about is, that, in fact, at this stage, we have no recognition that soil could play any part in the sequestration of greenhouse gases. Everybody says, too hard, too difficult. We've got too much carbon already in the soil. And I can bring you to farms where there's that much topsoil. And I will guarantee that they contain a different overall content of carbon than a little bit of topsoil in Canterbury, which is that depth. And that's all you got. But people say, oh, well, you know, we've got so much carbon, we can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about it, but you can build soil. And all you've got to do is, in fact, use the best principles to do that. So I'll, I'll finish very quickly then. So if we look at the options and opportunities around agriculture, I think they're very considerable if we are prepared to be creative and explore different areas where, in fact, we could find solutions. If we look at New Zealand, we have high fertile soils, we have wonderful sunlight, we have excellent vegetation. All of these contribute to us being the photosynthetic capital of the world. So if we use the right plants, we can capture more carbon dioxide per unit of land than almost anywhere on the planet. So that's very appealing. Uh, we've got the right climate, we, if, we, if we reduce the diversity of plants, and all of these are part of the regenerative agriculture agenda diversity, make sure this is happening. So I believe we have an opportunity to, pr to produce sinks here in New Zealand, uh, unlike anywhere else. 
If we look at what the farmers are suggesting we do, the farmers are suggesting we have a flat levy. This is Hewok Ekanoa. And we want native bush in there. They want carbon sequestration on the table, although it's not on the table by the commission at this stage. And uh, they want to use the levies they gain from levying people for fertilizer use, and, uh, those things, and they're going to invest it back in research. So that's a farmer's approach. Uh, how do, how do I believe we can control greenhouse gases in New Zealand? I believe what we can do is we can use different strategies for different systems. I believe that the ability of soil to store carbon is something we haven't explored properly or quantified, and we should do that. I'm not suggesting it's going to be the answer, but it certainly should be properly evaluated. And the regenerative models will allow us to do that, because the regenerative models are about building soil and building carbon. Uh, if we want to talk about controlling methane, we can control methane, obviously, by uh, having the animals uh, eat healthy pastures, because if we keep our soil healthy and uh, aerated, then that we, we don't produce large amounts of methane. So we can choose the crops, we can choose what, what we feed the animals, we can choose how we grow the crops to minimize the levels of methane going into the system and control the amount of it. We can also, if we're smart enough, work out how can we maximize the use of hydroxyl radicals to control methane from animals excreting. So if the animals, in fact, if the height of the pasture is important, we need to establish that. And lastly, we can control nitrous oxide and nitrate, but just controlling fertilizer. We're the world's greatest users of urea. We don't need all that much urea because it's not necessary. If we look at the suggestion as to what the world is going to do about greenhouse gases, this is a suggestion from the Climate Commission. We're going to produce GM ryegrass. We're going to have trees growing in dairy land. We're going to have methane inhibitors. We're going to have uh, not, not, uh, urea inhibitors. We're going to have low carbon breathing. And if we look at all these lists of new opportunities to control greenhouse gases, they're really very ambitious. And my experience of science is it doesn't deliver a lot in a short period. So if we're talking about putting something on the table that's going to be effective within the next decade, you've got to look at those and see what you think is really going to be a flyer. And uh, I'm not suggesting they're not going to be flyers, but I'm saying we need to explore what they are and if alternatives. So rather than looking for new high-tech solutions, I'm suggesting if we go back and look at nature and manage nature a little more appropriately, we could do well. If we look at what I call the GHG mistakes, I believe we have at this stage exaggerated the role of methane as a greenhouse gas in agriculture. It may well be that the real role of methane is much of a much lower order than everyone wants to propose. And that's important because that puts New Zealand farming in a different light altogether. We have no life cycle analysis of what happens to these molecules, how long they live for or what they, what they do. Uh, and I'm saying the journey from a mobile burp to atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is turning methane into carbon dioxide, is completely uncharted. And uh, we need to understand a lot more about hydroxyl radicals. We need to understand a lot more about carbon storage in soil. And when we've done that, then we can decide, I think, which are going to be winners. And we want no more of this. Because to me, it is shameful that we start talking about getting milk as zero carbon by growing a forest somewhere down the road. What we have to talk about it at the level of emissions we can manage and how we can remove the emissions after they are emitted. So I think we've got lots to do, but I feel at this stage we, we have other options and by removing carbon from the agenda completely and by not understanding hydroxyl completely, we may be in fact missing two golden chances to do something interesting, which is unique for New Zealand. Thank you. So I'm going to say that it's like in the, get out of the windows up. Um, it's been most uh, engaging having Right. We have a couple of minutes left. There's nothing uh, radical or controversial about your suggestions, Frank. Um, 
No. Uh, uh, there is, there is in that, uh, if you mention carbon, people just, just, just play it over. Carbon, you we were too much on it, too hard to measure, we don't want to go there. That's really the, the universal response I get. I mean, if you if you apply for money to the carbon, it probably will get funded. Yeah, what do you mean carbon sequestration? Sorry. Carbon sequestration or carbon exactly. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that our block in North Otago is not contributing well to carbon sequestration because it's just the rubbish, rubbishiest soil we've ever seen. All right, so people online are welcome to um, put a hand up. I'll see if I can see that. Uh, what do you want in the room? Shakti. Uh, I've been doing this topic monitoring. How much impact it will have in the next decade process like how much time it takes for other things. So we're good doing this carbon thing actually doing research on it, getting the results that will that take another decade. Uh, no, I know I know there, there's a timeline for to, to introduce any of these things. Yeah. But what I'm concerned about is that we go forward with a policy for New Zealand, which is basically a levy based on production. And that's the only thing that, that's what's on the table at present from Devoca. They say we want a, a flat levy. Now, to me, a flat levy, if we look at the different sectors, I believe most beef and lamb farmers in the country are probably carbon neutral. But if we look at the balance between what they're sequestering and what they're emitting, we find the probably good balance. If you look at all the vegetation on the property and all the other things. Right? So there's a huge cohort of New Zealand farmers who probably should be paying nothing rather than being left. Right? So that's where I'm just looking for something which is the equity in the system which means the right people are paying. Because if you're going to use an excessive amount of urea and have a flat levy, you're not paying the full price. Right? Because we have to look at, because if we look at urea, it is one of the most energy demanding substances on the planet. We've got to take, or we take methane, we start with methane, we use it as a substrate, that means methane is an energy source, we feed them all together and we end up with ammonia, and then we produce urea. That is incredibly expensive if you put the true life cycle costs in there. And I think we can fudge these things and create credits and, and offsets, but we're talking about controlling uh, greenhouse gas. So that's. Okay, Frank. Yeah. Here's the question. Uh, we've actually got quite a lot of questions in, um, uh, from the chat box. Thank you. Um, so I'll read out the question for people who can't see the screen. Um, we have seven years to reduce our GHDs by 43%. What are your fastest solutions to this requirement? What would be what would you do? I mean, we are specifically talking, well, you can talk wider than farming if you want, but if yeah. you were to be in front of a farming audience and someone says to you, what's the fastest thing we could do? Yeah, I would uh, uh, reduce the number of cows. I would suggest rather than using, I don't think we're talking about reducing the number of animals at all, what we're talking about is maximizing the health productivity of the animals. So if we're looking at a 60% conception rate, well, then we've got to think about that being really quite important because that means your reproductive uh, activity in those animals is not anything like what it should be. So uh, looking at the health and well-being of the animals is one thing that you have to maximize, to maximize production for the emitters, uh, have the minimum number of emitters with the maximum amount of production from those. So I think increasing production, managing animals, uh, more effectively, but I think having uh, putting in polycultures rather than monocultures as a food source would immediate, should have immediate impacts. And the suggestion has been that you, you, you in fact don't need to affect profit at all by changing from a very heavy industrial chemical approach to an organic approach. Right. Um, I think. On that resounding note, Frank, we are out of time. <laughs> so I'm sorry for the other 27 questions online. <laughs> um, if, if, if they send the questions to me, I'm very happy to answer. Message sent. Okay, well, look, Frank, thank you very much. And uh, those of us who are still here after one o'clock, come back anytime, Frank. Welcome.